Uh, what I'd like to talk to you about today is traumatic injuries of the ascending and descending uh, aorta. This is a picture we definitely don't want to see. This is a post-mortem uh, photograph of a descending aorta that's ruptured. There's a right, you know, quite a large hole from a dec um, decelerating injury. However, not all injuries are this radical. There is a grading system, which I think is very useful in, in triaging these injuries. Grade one are intimal tears, grade two, intramural hematomas, grade three, pseudoaneurysms, and grade four, frank ruptures. Now, the location of the injury is also key. I think this is nothing new. Everybody knows this. Uh, a predominant location is distal to the left subclavian artery. However, we shouldn't forget that a significant number, about 15%, are either in the arch, in the ascending aorta, or in the aortic root. These injuries tend to be more lethal. So the first large study that gave us some insight into the treatment of, uh, of traumatic uh, aortic injuries is the American Association for Surgery of Trauma. And as it's been mentioned, this, is, this was performed by the trauma surgeons. The first trial, AAST1, which was in 1997, a multi-center trial, 50 trauma centers, over 270 injuries, 80% of these were from motor vehicle accidents, over 200 patients underwent operative repair. And what did this operative repair look like? Most patients had a uh, repair with a bypass technique, be it full bypass or partial bypass, but there was still a significant number, about 30% with clamp and sew. However, that group had about a 16% paraplegia rate. Good then, but certainly unacceptable now. Now, there was a quiet revolution going on in the background at the same time. I was in my first year of training, of surgical training at Stanford when this was published. This was published in, of all things, the radiology journal uh, by Cato and colleagues, and his colleagues were Dr. Miller and Dr. Mitchell, Dr. Semba. Uh, is thoracic endograft repair. This was the first report of 10 patients with traumatic injuries that were repaired with an endovascular technique. This is one of these patients. Now, these patients aren't exactly what we are treating today. They had chronic aneurysms of uh, traumatic etiology. Uh, a large aneurysm, excuse me, there was a large aneurysm which was covered in, in a successful treatment. Um, this paper really showed the feasibility of endovascular treatment of traumatic aneurysms. And from that time on, the technology has certainly evolved and certainly the indications have been broadened uh, and this is really standard therapy right now. So the next trial by AAST was performed in 2007, so a decade later from the initial trial. And what we see now is basically a comparison between endovascular and open therapy. Uh, there, there was also some evolution in the open therapy in that clamp and sew was now significantly decreased. The bottom line message is mortality, and mortality was affected significantly. Operative op mortality went down from 23% to 7%. That is a very, very significant difference. When we adjust in multivariable fashion for, uh, for the risk factors of these patients, the uh, odds, uh, odds ratio for death with uh, uh, open repair is almost eight times greater. That is staggering. However, systemic complications were no different. There is a but. There's always a but. And the but to stent, uh, stent grafts is uh, complications. There's about a 20% complication rate. Uh, and in this study, almost a 14% uh, percent rate of endoleaks. So I think this has to be kept in mind, especially when we're treating young patients as trauma patients are. The other uh, data or lack of data is the follow-up. What happens to a stent graft that's implanted in a 20-year-old over 30 years? Nobody knows. We have some insight. This is a, published, uh, a paper that is about to be published in the Journal of Vascular Surgery from 2013. Um, small number of patients, 27 patients. And, uh, however, in follow-up, 4 out of 22, or 18%, had uh, stent-related complications. And these were significant complications. And these are young patients. Two of these patients are in their 20s. One is 40, one is a little older, is 69. And the timing of the complications were any between six months to uh, five years after the initial procedure. I think this needs to really be uh, monitored and, uh, and kept in the back of our minds. I, I'm certainly not an opponent of uh, endovascular therapy. I, I'm actually a fan. But I think we need to keep certain things in perspective. And a word of caution, I think, is in young patients with small aortas. We often see 18-year-olds where the aortic, aortic diameter is 18 millimeters or smaller, and should we put a stent graft in, uh, in that setting? Um, that, as we all know, the aorta dilates over time. So by the time that person is 60, the aorta will be much larger. Nobody knows what will happen to the stent graft. And I think uh, one point that's uh, often ignored and not really talked about is follow-up. 
radiologic follow-up. How do we follow these patients? How long do we follow these patients? Do we CT a 20-year-old every year for the next 50 years? What are the alternatives? The other, of course, issue is poor compliance. A 20-year-old will not come to see a doctor every year. I mean, that, that, that's just unrealistic. So I think that needs to be worked out a little better. As I already mentioned, there's about a 20% uh, device-related complication. I think that will be reduced as, um, as the technology advances and it's advancing every year. The, these are a couple of photos here of, uh, of tragic complications. One is stent infolding and the other is uh, thrombosis. Another important fact that came out of the, uh, of the second uh, AAST study was delayed treatment. A number of these patients were uh, treated within 24 hours of the initial injury and uh, another group beyond 24 hours. And these, these patients were actually quite well matched for their characteristics and it allowed uh, a comparison of, of what delaying treatment uh, may do for our ultimate outcome. And again, we see a significant reduction in, in mortality. Early repair, be it endovascular or open, about 16% and delayed repair, 5%. Again, a significant advancement in our evolution of, of treating these sometimes very difficult patients. So if we compare the two studies, I, I think it's interesting to look back because we have a span of a decade where things have changed tremendously. In the first study in 1997, the predominant diagnostic modality was angiogram. Now that's changed radically to 2007 where almost uh, everything is uh, diagnosed with a CT. Now that may be good or bad because now we are picking up much smaller injuries, so-called uh, uh, minimal aortic injuries, and the dilemma becomes what should be done about those injuries, if anything. We've changed our operative approach. We have a much lower periprigilate, much higher rate of bypass when we do it open, but certainly endovascular therapy has taken over, and I think rightfully so. And the other, which I already mentioned, is delaying therapy, stabilizing these patients. As we know, most patients with aortic injuries never have an isolated aortic injury. This is a high-impact accident. They'll have a head injury, abdominal trauma, extremity trauma, and so on. So there is, a, there is certainly benefit to delaying surgery. If it can be delayed, not everybody can. So I think the next evolution, or almost a, re a revolution, came when, when I was a, a a cardiothoracic resident at Stanford much, much later. A friend of mine, Tony Caffarelli, put this together. I was a little bit dismayed because now we decided that these patients we were going to treat non-operatively, which is uh, certainly not an advantage for a surgical resident. So uh, this was a study where uh, selected patients uh, were treated in non-operative fashion. Blood pressure control and very tight uh, radiologic follow-up. In the initial part of the study, from 2001 to 2004, most people were uh, operated on, and beyond 2005, we took this deliberate non-operative uh, approach. Most of these patients had pretty significant injuries. They had pseudoaneurysms. They weren't large pseudoaneurysms, but they were pseudoaneurysms, so, so they required very close surveillance. Um, Tony compared non-operative and op operative patients. Again, this, this is a small number of patients, but at the end of the day, Mortality was no different, or survival was quite similar in hospital survival. The question becomes, well, what happens in the long term? We don't know, although what he published was about a three-month follow-up, so not very long, but we have some, some indication of what happens. Most of these injuries stayed stable. They didn't change. Uh, five resolved completely, and one out of the 27 patients required uh, an elective operation because of progression of the pseudoaneurysm. Certainly a lot more work needs to be done in this field to uh, determine that this is the way to go. I think this is a great Canadian study which really sums up our evolution. This was just published uh, this year. Basically all trauma patients or uh, uh, blunt aortic injuries in Canada from 2002 to 2009. We see the proportion of aortic repairs on the uh, y-axis here. In red are the open repairs, in blue are the endovascular repairs. And we see a steady trend by 2009 less than 40% of patients in Canada are getting operative repair. And of those that are getting it, of course, most are getting uh, endovascular therapy. Uh, I'll skip this slide. Uh, let's not forget about the ascending aorta. As I mentioned, it is less frequent, uh, but, uh, but certainly more lethal. Here, the patients are more injured. Uh, there's much higher rate of head injury, uh, which requires uh, conservative management. Most of these patients die. 
I think most will agree, without a, a, a concomitant lethal injury, we would operate on these patients. So in, uh, in conclusion, uh, blunt aortic injury is not just uh, a, a, a isolated injury. It must be considered that, uh, that these are polytrauma patients. I think TVAR is apparently the, uh, currently the procedure of choice, but some caution has to be utilized here, especially in young patients with low-grade injuries. I think open repair still definitely has a role. I don't think that should go away. And certainly non-operative treatment of, uh, of low-grade injuries uh, needs further evaluation. And I think this may be the toughest part for surgeons because the toughest part is to do nothing. <laughs>